Dan Van Jack. Welcome to Advanced Passion, the show where I invite a guest to come and evangelize me about something they are passionate about it could be absolutely anything a book a movie an experience a place a person an idea anything at all and as they share that with me we then explore that meaning to them what it tells us about the human experience and what it might even tell us about how to reach the world with the good news of the gospel today i'm delighted to be joined by another fantastic guest the director of share jesus international mr andy frost andy how are you hey i'm good mate i'm presently in south london and it's freezing cold today but hey but the uh, sky is clear. It is. And up here in Manchester, it, the sky is perfectly blue. I can see it out my window now. It's beautiful. But like you say, very crisp and cold. <laughs> it never feels to amaze me. Yeah, it never feels to amaze me how you can look out the window in, in, uh, in England and it can look like just a beautiful day. And then you can go outside and it's like, man, it's yeah, cold. Minus 18 or something. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Andy, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, family life, uh, Share Jesus International. What's it all about? So, yeah, my name's Andy. I'm based in South London and uh, born and bred South London. And I run a charity called Share Jesus International, helping churches think through how to do mission and uh, share Christian faith. I'm married to Joe, who works at the Evangelical Alliance, and I've got two kids, uh, Eloise and Tilly, who are 10 and 8, and uh, I enjoy, yeah, doing kind of life in South London. Amazing. And, and how long have you been doing the Share Jesus International? How long has that been going? A long, long time, about 20 years now. So I actually, uh, interesting, I, I kind of came to faith um, when I was 18, and my dad ran the ministry, and I always vowed as a kid never to work with my dad and never to work with the church. <laughs> <laughs> but funnily enough, I ended up doing both uh, for a kind of set of circumstances. And um, my dad died uh, 14 years ago and I applied to become a director and I became a director. And uh, 14 years on, I'm still the director and still doing a whole wow. variety of different things, looking at how we communicate the Christian faith today. Yeah, you in particular produce a number of resources to help the church. I know you just released one around um discipleship and we chat about that more in the one thing podcast so do go and listen to advanced one thing to hear more about that specifically but what's the thinking behind the resources that you guys put putting out is uh, about equipping and helping the church for for witness yeah the little booklets i create i do two a year just very kind of um helping the church think through how we share the christian faith relevantly and faithfully really and for me um, culture has shifted and changed so much for the last number of years and we need to be wrestling with some big questions around how we share the Christian faith, about what it looks mm. like, but also around the whole subship piece as well and how it helps people on that journey of faith going forward. So my previous booklet was looking at how we connect social action and faith sharing. And for me, I think it's brilliant over the last two years, during COVID particularly, the church has done so much to really serve practically their communities. It's been fantastic. But the danger is, thing, is that the church becomes just a social action agency rather than mm. being the church, and yet we are called to be the church. And so for me, it's how do we... Uh, in the most appropriate ways, connect how we communicate the gospel as we serve people practically as well. So that booklet explores the challenge and the opportunity there to help churches wrestle through those questions and think about what, what it might look like practically in their context. All right, if people want to get hold of those booklets, if they want to find out more about Share Jesus International, where, where can they do that? There's one website, it's uh, sharejesusinternational.com. Nice it's so long. simple. It's nice so simple. Long. Well, it's long, but at least it is, <laughs> it it's is. what it says on the tin, right? So that's go. very helpful. Go. All right, we'll put links in the description below. And of course, while you're uh, checking that out, why not hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of these great conversations. Leave us a like, uh, leave a comment, ask us a question, leave us a thought. We love to hear back uh, from you. Speaking of resources, Andy, tell me a little bit about your book, Long Story Short. Yeah, I mean, I, I love stories. And I think that ultimately we are storied creatures. We understand the world by stories. And so I wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago now looking really um, at how we find a story for our lives. And I think kind of in our culture at the moment, there are, there are three common small stories that we often live by. The first story is how can I be happy? And what do I need to achieve or do something to be happy in life? Second of all is how can I be significant? How can I make a difference mm. in the world? And mm. thirdly, how can I be safe? Uh, actually, the world is so scary, particularly with things like COVID and wars and everything else how can i make myself as safe as possible but i argue in the book that ultimately these three stories are way too small that actually they don't fulfill our understanding of what life is all about we need to find a bigger story to live for and that ultimately the christian faith is based upon the bible and the bible gives us this meta narrative this big story and that helps us ultimately discover what it is to have joy and the idea of happiness the idea of significance in god's story but also a safety that actually we know that God is with us and God is for us. No matter what we face in life, we can have this promise from him. So it explores those three small stories and this big 
story. Yeah, that's cool. I'm fascinated by stories. I love, I love storytelling. I love story in media um, forms. And it's interesting to me that we have so much entertainment now, so many different options, mm. but most of it's driven by, by story. And, you know, there are so many ways that we can fill our time. And yet one of the primary ways that we seek to distract ourselves is through, is through storytelling. Of course, it's not just about distraction. People want to be, they want to learn about the world. They want to see themselves reflected back on, on the screen. What are you seeing as you kind of survey all the thousand of one streaming services that we now and all the different stuff that's coming out? What are you, are you seeing those stories continue to play out? Have you seen, have you noticed any shifts and tweaks to trends over the last couple of years? Oh, I think there's lots more trends. Now we're seeing looking at the kind of, uh, having just experienced COVID, all the kind of <laughs> end of the world type stories were kind of on, on right. Netflix, weren't they, and things. But I think, I mean, it, we are surrounded by stories, even the stories we're not even fully aware of. Like when you walk past, um, uh, kind of um, a war memorial, for example. Yeah, that tells a story. Yeah, when you're kind of walking past an and um, an advert from McDonald's, <laughs> you're being told a story that actually everywhere around us we're being told. So stories are powerful. Stories have this ability to to get under our skin, to really engage with our emotions, and um, stories help us discover uh, kind of who we are, what life is all about. So. Stories are a powerful medium in so many different ways. I think as the church, often we've missed the power of story. And yet ultimately, Jesus was a storyteller. He did many different mm. things, but he was also a storyteller. And, uh, and he told these stories that would captivate crowds and would really challenge the injustice of the day and present the kingdom of God. And for me, I think we need to rediscover the power of story, but also ultimately mm. how our lives tell a story. And uh, what does that mean for us in the 21st century and how we help people discover mm. their story in God's story? Mm. We'll take it that a bit further then. If people are walking past a war memorial and that's telling a story in McDonald's and that's telling a story, what kind of stories? I appreciate this is a horrifically big and generalized question, <laughs> but what kind of stories do you think people are reading and seeing and, and, and thinking about when they walk past their average local church? I think the, the sad thing is that many of the, of the buildings they pass just look quite kind of shut up and cold and whatever mm. else is. Um, yeah. I mean, I also say, what does it look like when people leave the church building on a Sunday morning as you walk past? What, what is your initial kind of thought, I guess, when you see that happen as well is another interesting thought. Often we look coming out of church looking quite <laughs> grumpy sometimes. That's not, not particularly good. Um, so it's a massive challenge. There's a, there's a great uh, local church near me, which has this kind of big glass window. For the last 15, 20 years, every kind of, um, every season, they decorate the window in a different way that tells a story. And I mm. found a really powerful way that even just using that little piece of glass, they are communicating something with the outside of the world. Must have thousands of people pass the church every day. Wow. And yet there's something that is being provoked and challenged. Um, and I think often we miss the importance perhaps of, using the arts and creativity to tell those stories. My mum is actually an artist. She's a textile artist and she um, has created these pieces of textiles that unpack the book of Revelation. And there's about oh, 15 wow. of them. And it's the biggest, uh, the biggest piece of textile work by one artist in the world. And it's no been in cathedrals for the last uh, five or six years. And they find that when people come into cathedrals, they find out about the history of the building and when it was built and everything else. Her artwork is a way of exploring something of the Christian faith. And there's a, a, the final panel explores that picture of a new heaven and a new earth. And it's been profound. People writing notes in the, kind of the book at the bottom who've had these moments encountering God as they've seen this, this kind of picture of a new heaven and a new earth. It's really spoken mm. to them personally. And so I think there was something really powerful about how do we project and tell these stories that are so rich and that speak wow. directly into people's contexts today. I'd love that. And I love that there's an opportunity for people then to to not just experience the story and, 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 and have something within them, but to express it. Yeah. Because if we never hear those stories back, some we're going to probably, you know, delude ourselves sometimes as to what the world thinks. We need to hear clearly, don't we? Is that part of the challenge you think is actually opening ourselves up to hear the stories from people as to what they think and what, what our lives and our communities are, are, what kind of stories are being shaped in people's minds? Yeah. I mean, I love to ask some of the question what's your story? Yeah. Because you don't ask them where to begin it or where to finish it, but you almost get the permission to say, well, what do they want to share with you? And so even that one question can actually open a really rich conversation about life and meaning and purpose, because what is your story? 
And yeah. so I guess there is that, that powerful thing about how do we listen well to our culture? How do we hear what our culture is saying? But how do we speak then almost prophetically into what our culture is saying and actually present something of the gospel? Um, Lawrence Singlehurst, uh, he helped me with this idea of, of, of telling stories well that, again, I found a very helpful thing to do is when someone asks us about why we're a Christian, what is our faith all about? is to respond by saying, well, can I tell you one of my favorite stories? People always mm-hmm. say yes to that. And you just take one of your favorite stories in the gospel and you just tell that story in your own words. And what often happens is, is people, first of all, they, they, they've not heard them before. I remember mm-hmm. telling my, my friend the story, I was with a guy recently um, about the woman caught in adultery. I told him that story. And he was just completely blown away by it. He was a, he was a, wow. a Hindu by background. And that evening he had a dinner party at his house. And he said, right, <laughs> everyone, I met this Christian guy this morning. He told me this story. I want to tell you the story now as well. So almost he shared the wow. story with a wider group around the table because he was so, so amazed cool. by the story. And so for me, there's something powerful in the stories of Jesus that actually uh, sometimes we can rush to share. Well, can I kind of show you this kind of illustration of the gospel? But actually by telling a story, we open a door and almost every story communicates a depth or a truth about the gospel message as well. So that woman in adultery talks about actually there needs to be no shame. Mm-hmm. It's about the grace of God kind of stepping into that woman's life, what it means for each and every one of us now going forward. So, yeah, I think um, stories are really important, how we listen to the, what's happening in the world, but also how we communicate the stories of God relevantly as well. Super cool. Right. This show is called Advanced Passion, so we should get stuck into what your passion actually is. I want to hear about it. I want to be evangelized about it. And then I want to see where we go from there. So, Andy, what is your passion? What am I learning about today? So I think you've heard about kind of traveling previously, but I'm into adventure traveling. Okay. I love new places, new experiences and going on an adventure. Okay. okay. So how would you separate? Uh, the, what's the difference between, you know, OK, I'm going on holiday for a week to a nice place. That's a bit of an adventure from what I think you're talking about, which is the next step up of, of adventure, intentional adventure. I mean, adventures are often uh, defined as being exciting or daring experiences. So for me, it's not about something safe. So what I I don't like on holiday, I don't like, well, I like it for a day, but I don't like kind of (laughs) staying in a nice hotel by a pool, just relaxing. I'm not into that at all. My wife, on the other hand, enjoys that. So it's a bit of a kind of, bit of a conflict (laughs) there. But I like doing stuff that pushes me out of my comfort zone, scares me, that gives me a new experience. And so for me, that is what adventure is really. It's... um, it's taking myself out of the normal and the ordinary and giving myself something else to experience. Yeah, give me, give me some examples of this. What, what adventures have you had that you're particularly uh, um, thankful for and excited about? So with my, one of my uh, best mates, Rich Ellington, um, we've been on a few adventures together. We've actually made some videos, which are presently offline, but hopefully will come online again soon, uh, called The Adventures of the Ginger Vicar and the Bolding Bishop. I am the Bolding <laughs> Bishop. Uh, he is the Ginger Vicar. Uh, I'm not actually a bishop, but uh, I've got the baldy bit down. And then um, basically we've gone to different places and had adventures. So we went to Costa Rica um, a number of years ago, and the plan was to go bull riding. Now, oh. I've always seen it, you know, on, on TV. I thought, wouldn't that be cool to go and do? So we had this kind of very traumatic experience getting to Costa Rica. We were there for a different um, thing at the same time. So we were kind of there doing ministry. But we thought on the back end of this trip, we'll try and bull ride. Had it all lined up a couple of times. Both times it fell through at the last minute. Um, apparently you can't bull ride when it's wet. So I discovered that as oh. a new kind of thing to discover. Um, so uh, that didn't work out. And we thought it was going to be a complete failure. But instead, we joined a circus. So there you go. <laughs> that was my adventure in Costa Rica. <laughs> what, happened, what happened to joining the circus? Well, we were really gutted. Eh? We'd, we'd, we'd you know, planned this trip. We'd, we'd you know, done some other stuff. We'd been surfing and we'd... Um, yeah, kind of had kind of uh, little bikes on the beach and stuff, been great fun, but we hadn't really had a great adventure as such. Driving back and um, there's a massive circus on the right hand side, we're driving back and Rich goes, where's going to the circus and find out if we've got some animals in there. So we pulled off and, and Rich kind of, um, yeah, knocked on the guy's door and said, hi there, um, we're, we're from the UK, we're, we're making a video, um, do you have any lions we could try and ride or something like that? And the guy was like, no, 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 we're not into the animal stuff. That's not what we do here. You know, that's kind of cool. Um, we have got other stuff you can do. And we're like, okay, cool. So we went inside this venue and uh, basically had something called uh, the pendulum of, of doom and the, uh, and the globe <laughs> of death. So the pendulum of doom is we're basically, it's got these two circles. You know, you've seen them before in the circus where you kind of walk around the bottom one, the whole thing. Oh, it moves around. around. So, um, not speaking any Spanish, this guy agrees to let us, let us have a go. 
So we had to go on there and there's no, no crash mats, no safety nets, anything else at all. It's absolutely so scary. And then he lets us go in this globe, which is one of those kind of metal globes where you get in a motorbike and you try and drive oh, yeah. around the globe. Yeah. I can't ride a motorbike. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> the first me... thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Not really the best place to learn, really. And then, uh, but then Rich messed it up as well. So it wasn't too bad. But the idea of, of looking for adventure, looking for new experiences in different places has been what we do. I've uh, done a whole variety of things, including um, wing walking and uh, all, all kinds of stuff. So where does this sense of adventure come from then? I think for me, um, I've always liked to push my limits. So I, um, uh, I do a lot of stuff physically as well. So I did my first 10K swim um, last year and I swam uh, and I did a 105 mile run a couple of years ago as well. So oh, wow. Um, wow. always looking to, to push how far I can go the limits of my fears really. Um, I've always been passionate about surfing as well. I've always been pushing into bigger and bigger waves. And so for me, it's always been a sense of, I want to push the boundaries of things and see how far I can go. I think it comes from almost um, a, a desire for me just to see what is possible and just to experience new things. Mm, I think it's fascinating that you, you do have people in this life who seem to just run towards danger and then people who just you know run as far away from it as possible and i guess you know it's not a psychology podcast but i, I guess there'd be loads of different reasons why um the, you know the way that we're made the way that we've grown up the, the experiences that we've had or haven't had uh in life but i think it's interesting that there are people in in the church who see evangelism as a great adventure to run towards and then there's many people in the church who are just like nope not for me thanks way too scary way too much potential rejection too much fear of man um does it ha like in an adventure setting we would say okay well look if you're not feeling it you don't have to go in the wheel of death right <laughs> but but and that's fine you're just not wired to be adventurous but can we have that same messaging in the church okay you're just not wired that way so you don't need to do it that that clearly doesn't seem to be the way of the bible right no, I think everyone gets to be involved. And actually, ultimately, we are all called to have an adventure with Jesus. That's what life's all right. about. Um, and I think the danger is that we think the Christian faith is some nice, safe bubble to be in mm. rather than a mission we're called to be a part of. And so there is that challenge in there. Now, that doesn't mean you have to kind of go jumping out of planes and kind of mm. climb down cliffs to go and do that. But it is about... Uh, everyone on differing levels being pushed out of our comfort zone slightly and about looking for how we can join God in his mission. I believe that God's already at work in our culture. God's already at work in our society and being a Christian is about teasing out what is God doing and how can I be obedient in stepping out and in following him in different ways. And for me, mm. it's been, there have been some times it's been really kind of crazy and full on. And there have been times it's been very, very simple. I mean, if I tell you a quick story about a crazy way, I was, I was, I was walking home one night and, um, uh, quite late at night, about 11 o'clock at night, and there's a local guy uh, who's an alcoholic, and he kind of thinks I'm a Catholic priest. I'll say I'm not, I'm not actually a Catholic priest, but um, <laughs> I saw him that night, and uh, he was across the road from me, and I, I thought, okay, I can't face the chaplain right now, it's dark, and I'm going to kind of focus and get home. And he shouted, hey, it's the Catholic priest. I'm like, no, no, it's just, just me, but no, I'm just going home, mate. No, no, come over here, come over here. I'm like, well, why? It's about to be a fight. I'm like, no, no, I'm going home. Thank you very much. He said, no, 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 come over here. Come over here. He pulled me into this fight. And there's just two guys, T-shirts off, about to have a punch up. And uh, he says to these two guys, guys, before you fight, listen to this Catholic priest. Listen to what he's going to say. I'm like, oh, first of all, I'm still not a Catholic priest. <laughs> uh, but let me just kind of, you know, uh, Jesus would say, turn the other cheek or some of those kind of lines. And their response was, please, sir, go away using very different vocabulary. <laughs> so sure. I began to kind of edge out the situation and they went, no, 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 try again, try again, try again. And so I just kind of raised my hands in the air and said, Father God, right now I pray for peace. And to my astonishment, just the, the peace of God came and these two guys put on their t-shirts and walked off in different directions. And it was like, wow. Um, there was a moment there to partner with God and to see what God was doing. And yeah, I so almost missed it because I was trying to keep to getting home and just, kind of do what i thought was right to do so mm. but it's a challenge there if there's amazing moments like that but also just in the simple things isn't it and mm. uh, a lady i know locally is grieving and, and it's, just, it's just being there with her she she grieves so it, it's it's different levels and different seasons but yeah. for me it's about saying how can i work with god in what god is doing and be a vessel for him by his spirit mm. to, to minister to different people mm, it's very powerful and and it is relative in terms of adventure. One person's adventure is another person's day at the office, you know, and, and 
actually helping to meet people at where they're at with the experiences that they have with the personalities they have is is important while still recognizing that there's there are some objective realities to our christian faith that are true for everybody how we experience them sure they might manifest in slightly different ways in our emotions and our confidence in those things but there's still objective realities within our christian faith so how do we help the church journey towards a greater sense of of adventure i think first of all it's about reminding ourselves that the story in scripture that we are not at the very end yet we're in this season where jesus has come his life his death and his resurrection and then his commissioning his disciples we are part of this commissioning but that ultimately we know how the story ends we know there'll be a new heaven and new earth that picture of just how things will end and we live in this season now where god is at work in our world and we get to partner with him so i think first of all it's about reminding ourselves that um, we are part of what god is doing we are part of god's mm. story and then second of all i think it's about discovering uh, what is god doing our different locations or different situations and it's about learning i think just to tease out uh, what is god doing in my street what is god doing in my neighborhood that I don't bring god to situations god is already at work mm. in them god is already at work in 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 provoking questions in people's lives, in mm. um, in putting kind of passions people's lives. I've got a friend who's not a Christian, but he's got a real, real passion for God's justice, for his sense of justice. Mm. So I'm able to affirm him saying, mate, you know what? You're not a Christian, but this thing you have in your life, this desire for justice, I think that comes from God. Mm. And that provoked a massive conversation. So I think it's for looking for what God's already doing in and around our community, and thirdly, it's about saying, God, God, how are you calling me to step out? One of very simple thing is um, as Share Jesus called Prompt. And the idea is a, it's a question a week to look at and then to reflect upon and to ask God and then to see how God might help you answer that question. So it could be um, who needs to hear a story from the Bible this week. It could be who can I offer to pray for this week. It could be... Um, uh, who can I invite around for a meal this week? So simple questions that almost provoke us into thinking, I want to look around the world missionally and see what I can do to be a part of what God's doing. Um, I like, uh, I actually hate uh, seeing 3D films. Okay. Um, you know, the whole kind of, I, I'm yeah. not into the glasses and things. I went to a yeah, yeah, yeah. thing last year where you have the, the spray water and the, uh, mm-hmm. not my thing at all really. Um, <laughs> but it's amazing that when you're watching a 3D film, how you put on the 3D glasses and suddenly the movie kind of comes to life. And almost in a way, we need to almost wear almost God spectacles. That almost we, we choose to see the world through God's eyes and to see what God is doing and see how we can minister in different situations. And part of that, I think, is about slowing down our own busyness. It's about almost praying for our street, praying for our community more regularly and just looking for how we can respond to what God is doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's powerful. The, I remember hearing uh, a simplified, and it's a little bit too simplistic, but a simplified definition of evangelism as being joining in with what the Holy Spirit's already doing in a person's life. Mm. And it is going, not to, we, we do so often think that it's us that's going to take God there. And it's like, no, God's just kind of saying, come on, come and join yeah. in with what I'm already doing. Um, and I think that focus on partnership is really important because there's a lot of things in life that might seem like an adventure they might seem like um a dangerous thing to do or a scary thing to do that we are more inclined to do when we when we do them with some someone else and it's amazing how if you have a scary hospital appointment or something often people want to take someone with them they can't that person can't even come in to the doctor's you know the actual room with them but at least they're in they know they're in the waiting room and it's that moral support that emotional support pastoral support for a believer a spiritual support but again i think if we can help the church to journey in the direction of a better understanding of um outreach mission journeying with jesus in genuine partnership first with him mm. and then with each other we would be able to see a lot of uh, a lot of gains in that way so good so when i do my adventures with rich um we both push each other the whole time and if we weren't mm. by each other's side we probably wouldn't yeah do you wouldn't do it in the same way but yeah. unless you know no one's gonna know if i don't do this but because he's well, there's a fine he... line between there's a fine line between uh, <laughs> encouragement and peer pressure right <laughs> <laughs> there is there is there's definitely falls perhaps more to peer pressure than encouragement but, um, <laughs> yeah but i think you're completely right and what's what i love about um advance and what you're trying to do it's about it's help people to get, become part of a community and, and sharing our faith and i guess mm. for me it's also it's about saying who, yeah, who am I doing this with and who is praying for me and who's got my back and when things go wrong, 
Mm. Who can I share those things with? And when things go right, who can I celebrate with? And I think um, creating space for that is really important. And I, I think for me, when I've been mentored and mentoring other people, having that person to be alongside has been so helpful because when I get a really difficult question that I can't answer or when someone's going through something, I don't know how can God can speak into this. It gives me a space to really unpack what I'm discovering, unpack what I'm learning. But also it has somebody else speak into my context too. And I love mm. it that Jesus sends out the 72 in pairs, not by themselves, but in pairs. Yeah. He saw the importance of doing that. And I think um, in many different ways, when we're working alongside somebody, we have that space to share our experience. It's a much richer thing, but it also allows us to process uh, what is working and what isn't working when it comes to sharing our faith. Mm. If I go on a, on a crazy adventure experience of bungee jumping or jumping out of a plane or something, there's there's the necessary risk management that takes place. There's be risk. Hopefully, there'll be risk <laughs> assessments done. They'll you know they're checking the they're checking the cords, they're checking the clasps, they're double checking the reserve parachute, all of that, all of that stuff. Um, and that's good. And although we want a, a crazy experience, we also want to know that the right level of risk management has been done enough to keep me as safe as I can be, but not so much that it will dampen down and ruin the experience. What role do you think risk management and how appropriate is, is kind of risk management in our, in our faith walk? Well, I think, first of all, there is there's always going to be risk. And I think mm. perhaps sometimes we downplay the risk. And mm. I think right now, uh, yeah, there's certain parts of the world where people are being killed to their faith. Mm. And when they sign up to become a Christian, they know that is the risk. They know that ultimately they are surrendering their life to, for, for me to, to live as uh, Christ, to die as gain. That whole kind of concept becoming so real in people's lives. So there was always a risk. Mm. And, and I guess uh, partly perhaps it's about verbalizing what the risks are. So when my kids are scared of things, I talk through, okay, if this goes horribly wrong, what could happen? Mm. And then what could happen? And then what could happen? And almost just talking through that process and then fully aware of the implications. So I did the world's biggest bungee jump a couple of years ago and uh, <laughs> Epic. I didn't want to do it at all. I had no desire to do it, but Richard got me to do it. So I, I agreed to do it. And then, um, but again, just thinking through, okay, if this goes wrong, if this goes well, what can happen? And, and just kind of, yeah. And so when it comes to sharing off anything, often we don't do that. We don't think, out, well, what is the risk? If this competition goes really badly, what will this mean for this relationship, this friendship? And, but going through the worst case scenario, and working out, okay, working that backwards, what can we do to make sure it doesn't happen? Or what can we do to, to make sure it goes as well as we can do is a really helpful process. And I think ultimately, when we're sharing our faith, we are driven by love mm. and we're not meant to be kind of super confrontational. We're meant to be just sharing what God's done in our life and then sharing that story with other people. I find, again, really helpful um, with conversations just to know when to stop. And that uh, sometimes I want to kind of, um, chat to them about God wanting to see them come to faith there and then but actually sometimes that isn't my role sometimes my mm. role is just to sow some things into their life and then to stop at the right time I love the idea of being kind of almost holy spirit aware so when do we push things and when do we stop when do we pull back and then um, when somebody stops asking questions if we keep speaking then we've gone too far but almost we're allowing mm. them to, to to almost navigate the conversation for us is a really important thing but all those things are risk, I think. And when people know we're a Christian at work, that can mean challenges. People know we're a Christian at school, that can mean challenges. And we can be judged and people can turn their back on us. And that does happen sometimes. And then um, I think I've, I've experienced in my own life, just people who when they find out what I'm about. Oh, actually, I'm not sure I want to hang out with you quite as much mm, as I did sure. before. And um, there is that risk. I'm glad you mentioned motivation and the motivation being love, because, again, in the same way that having someone with us through a situation can help to spur us on, the motivation can affect our ability to, to go to the next level. You know, if our motivation is um, something trivial, we're less likely to go the extra mile. If our motivation is, you know, love or, 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 or necessity or need, you know, whatever it might be, it might drive us further. How do we help the church to continually remember that our evangelism motivation is not because we've been told to do something, but it's out of our love for God who first loved us. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I think particularly in, in church, you can think, well, how do I grow my church? How do I get more people into my church? Mm. And that whole mentality can be really dangerous. That, But ultimately, it is driven by love. And I think first and foremost, um, we have to be having time alone with God. I, I, I've written a little resource looking at habits and the habits we create that, 
we have all kind of habits about sharing our faith, but if ultimately we're not almost receiving from God first of all, that's kind of a really dangerous place to be in because we can become very mechanistic or uh, trying to kind of communicate things. But actually, first and foremost, we've got to be in a place with God. Where we're allowing God to remind us again of his love for us and uh, reminding again of who he is and who we are called to be, first and foremost. And um, I, I, I think I've also experienced in my life, there have been different seasons and it's working out in this season, how do you connect well with God? And um, when I have two very young kids, they weren't sleeping at all. It was a complete nightmare. And uh, we found it really hard even time with God. So I used to enjoy those quiet mornings of, you know, the, the light kind of coming through the window and just gradually opening mm-hmm. the Bible and having a nice reflective time in bed. But then my kids were jumping on at me, like, you know, <laughs> at five in the morning. It was like, there's no quiet time now. It's just like noise. Um, but we kind of got a chair put in our lounge uh, and it almost become like a, a prayer chair for us. We could just sit in that chair. And just that season, I found it really hard to connect with God, but it was creating ways so for me, just sat in that chair for at least five to eight minutes, just being still, being quiet and saying, God, can I just remind, can I be reminded again just of your love for me? So I think mm-hmm. love is a really important thing, how we create habits that will serve us in reminding us again of that. And then I think ultimately we think that, that God's, uh, God wants the best for other people and um, he's got their best interests at heart. He's got our best interests at heart. And for me, then as we're sharing our faith and, um, love has to be the motivation love has to be the guide and uh and the danger is we we, we try and scare people into the kingdom mm. or we try and you know kind of manipulate people into the kingdom right but ultimately it has to be about them discovering for themselves that actually the, the debt for their sin and their guilt and their shame has been paid for and that christ wants to set them free from that and he wants to empower them by his spirit to give them a sense of his peace and and that almost has to kind of navigate how how we do that mm. As we um, kind of head towards the end of, of the show this week, it'd be good, I think, to just draw it full circle around. We started talking about story. We've headed into adventure and the adventure of following Jesus and, and uh, sharing Jesus with the world. Um, we talked a little bit about how crucial story is to, to, to sharing faith and to talking to people, making connection points to people's lives and those things what's the role of story in stirring the church to adventure and also sustaining the church in the adventure when it's getting a bit wobbly about whether the adventure is really worth it? I think, first of all, it's really important that we regularly share stories from the front in our churches of what God is doing. Mm-hmm. There might be people coming to faith, which is fantastic. Um, but I guess the, the challenge to some churches, no one's come to faith for 10, 20 years. And so almost there's no stories to share and almost you can forget the gospel still works. Mm. And so it's important to have those stories of people coming to faith, but also those stories are people sharing their faith. That actually when we step out of our comfort zone, when we try and share our faith in some way, we often discover that God comes through in some incredible way too. We have these moments of, of, of sensing God at work. And so again, for me, it's about how do we share these stories from the front of our churches um, where it becomes normal. And what we do as church, we share more of who God is in the everyday. And um, I think for me, often people talk about having a, a faith that's become stale and, uh, and you kind of challenge them, you know, you know, are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you... But actually, are you sharing your faith? And often people mm-hmm. aren't. And actually, I think, again, when we have to uh, step out of our comfort zone, when we have to rely upon God, it makes our faith become so much more alive. Mm. And so I guess almost sharing those stories of when our faith comes alive as we step out of our comfort zone is a really important thing too. Mm. Thanks so much, Andy. Thanks for joining us on the show this week, giving us all your wisdom and insight and maybe Stephen stirring a few people to do a bungee jump as well along the way. Who knows? Who knows? (laughs) Or ride a bull or something crazy like that. Uh, Maybe we'll get you on again. And next time we'll have you uh, doing this at the same time as riding a bull. Uh, Sounds good, yeah why not right let's take to the next level um do connect with uh, andy through uh sharejesusinternational.com and uh, find his resources also we didn't talk about um very relevant to this podcast the resource that you wrote for for uh dads and their kids right about having adventures together oh hold up my here right here there you go there, there it is there you go yeah what's so to talk us through this one uh, 52 faith adventures for dads and their kids uh, it's the idea really yeah. that as a dad um, I want my kids to know Jesus. And uh, I think what's happened over the last number of years is sometimes we church kids workers come on so well that often we can think that our, my kids faith is, is the church's role or the module mm-hmm. as a parent. And so really mm-hmm. this book is about looking at how we can be 
play a role as parents that ultimately, ultimately we are the, the kind of key figures for our kids in exploring faith. And it's really about creating some memories for your kids. So doing some fun stuff, yeah, cool. um, doing adventures. So it's kind of climbing trees and making dens and making fires and stuff in the house as well. Things that you can do adventures, but all of them have with them a story and a prayer to link with them. So the idea of, of creating cool. these kind of key memories around adventure, but at the same time sharing more of the Christian faith with your kids in a fun way. Great stuff, Andy. Thanks so much for joining us uh, today. Thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of these great conversations. Give us a little like, leave a comment below, and we will catch you next time.